So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this parallel session on the impact of COVID-19 and mitigation measures on poverty and inequality in the developing world. I am Matteo Ricciardi. Um, I'm the director of the Center for Microsimulation and Policy Analysis at the University of Essex, and I will chair the session. Um, this session is actually um, based on the work done for the SouthMod project uh, for which uh, Union Wider, with a number of partner institutions, developed uh, uh, micro tax benefit micro simulation models for a number of African and uh, uh, Latin American and also some Asian countries. So today we have uh, um, two presentations followed by discussion and uh, and then uh, general, uh, uh, even if short. Uh, uh, Q&A session uh, with the audience. So the first uh, presentation is on uh, African countries and uh, it is presented by Jesse Lastunen, uh, who's a research associate at uh, UNU Wider. The paper has a long list of, uh, of uh, co-authors. And so uh, Jesse, I, I leave the stage to you and that will be followed by a uh, five minutes discussion by um, Miracle. And then uh, we will have a few minutes uh, for comments uh, uh, from the audience. Yes, so the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Matteo. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining the presentation and coming to the session. Um, so I'll be talking about our paper, uh, To the Rescue. And uh, as Matteo mentioned, I want to emphasize that this work comes from a collaboration of more than 30 people, uh, both in Africa and also here in Finland and in the UK. So uh, we have a really, really large group. Um, so our work on Africa is part of a larger research project, uh, project uh, focusing on the distributional effects of the pandemic, uh, which we study using tax benefit microsimulation models. Um, this presentation concerns our work uh, on the five African countries listed here. However, we also have already published uh, two country-specific studies on South Africa and Ecuador, which I believe Javier will be talking about uh, in the next presentation. Uh, and we're also doing similar research uh, in Vietnam. Um, we have two main objectives or research questions in the study. Uh, first, we look at uh, the effects of the pandemic and related lockdown measures on poverty and inequality. Uh, and second, we look at the contribution of the, both the general tax and benefit system or automatic stabilizers and any new tax and benefit policies that were adopted uh, during the crisis. Uh, and we are specifically looking at the distributional effects uh, uh, of the crisis and these uh, policies. Uh, policies. Uh, here are the different steps uh, in our analysis. Our starting point is developing kind of a counterfactual data set for 2020 for each of these countries. Uh, this is a data set with information on the population in this hypothetical scenario where COVID-19 did not happen last year and things uh, went on as normal. Uh, in the second step, we develop so-called crisis data sets that actually do account for the effects of uh, COVID last year. I'll talk more about the specific uh, methodology later. Uh, the third step is about gathering information on any discretionary tax benefit policies adopted last year in response to the pandemic and also incorporating uh, those policies into the microsimulation models. Uh, and finally, we use the models and the data sets uh, I mentioned to estimate the effects of COVID and also the effects of policy changes made in response uh, to the pandemic. Uh, I'll start with the creation of these uh, crisis data sets uh, I mentioned. Uh, the first step here is estimating GDP shocks for different industries in each of the five countries in the study. Uh, these shocks are relatively simple, so we estimate the deviation of each sector's GDP from what it would have, would have been based on its growth trend over the past three years uh, before the pandemic. Uh, next, we allocate these macro-level shocks to the individual-level data that's actually used in the, in the microsimulation models. Uh, our basic approach is a random allocation methods, uh, method where uh, randomly selected workers in each sector are assigned to unemployment with zero income so that the total labor income in that sector is reduced in proportion to the GDP shock in the same sector. 
And again, the GDP shock comes from the deviation of 2020 GDP from its past uh, trend growth. Uh, also, currently for Uganda and hopefully also soon for some other countries, we also have access to World Bank uh, phone surveys from last year, which we use to kind of improve the accuracy of the, of the estimates. Uh, so this is kind of a robustness check or an alternative uh, method to allocate the shocks to the micro-level data. Uh, here, the losses for individual workers within industries uh, are imputed from the World Bank data. Basically, uh, individuals are more likely to lose some of their income if they have characteristics that correspond to a higher probability of actually losing income based on the survey. And these characteristics can involve, for instance, uh, age, gender, education, uh, formality, status of the work, and so on. Uh, the next step in the analysis is modeling uh, tax benefit policies or policy changes uh, made in response to the, to the pandemic. Uh, here, maybe the first thing to note, that, note is that uh, these types of policies have been quite limited, especially in Africa. Uh, there are, however, some measures that have been adopted and we've been able to model with information on eligibility uh, and different conditions. So uh, just a few examples from the five countries in our study. So uh, in Mozambique and Ghana, utility fees were reduced or waived for consumers uh, after the pandemic hit. Uh, Zambia enacted an emergency social gas transfer uh, that was provided to specific poor households for a period of six months uh, in 2020. And uh, Ghana actually had a quite large number of uh, different measures enacted overall, which we have modeled but the overall impact of these policies was actually negative on incomes. And this was fully because of this uh, large school feeding program uh, in the country was stopped for nine months during the pandemic. So yeah, it was kind of an un unintentional COVID-19 policy, which, we, which we've also uh, modeled. Uh, the final step in the analysis is actually running these micro simulation models with different data sets and policy systems uh, in place. Uh, in terms of the outcomes, we focus on uh, disposable income and income-based poverty and inequality. Uh, we also assess the, the extent to which uh, any shocks were mitigated by both automatic stabilizers, basically the general tax benefit system, and any new policies uh, that were adopted in response to the pandemic. And finally, we also look at uh, so-called income stabilization coefficients, uh, which I'll be uh, excluding from this presentation due to, due to the uh, strict time limits we have here. Uh, and before actually showing the results, here's a quick summary of the data sets and also policy systems that we use in the study. So as I mentioned, for each country, we have a so-called pre-crisis data sets that represents our counterfactual, what would have happened uh, without the pandemic, and we have a crisis data set that also includes the income shocks uh, from COVID. Uh, we also have two policy systems uh, for most countries, those countries that actually implemented any COVID-related policies. Uh, the first one uses policies in place up to March 2020, which means that uh, basically no COVID-related measures are included in, in this uh, policy system. Uh, the second one does include policies uh, that are COVID-related, basically any policies that were in place in the countries throughout uh, 2020. And this uh, gives us three modeling scenarios for each country. Uh, the first one is our counterfactual scenario with no COVID shocks in the data and also no COVID related uh, policies enacted. Uh, the second one is our full crisis scenario, which does include income shocks from COVID in the data and also policies adopted in response to the pandemic. So basically, this is what actually happened uh, last year. We also have this uh, third hypothetical scenario where we do include the shocks from COVID. So we use the crisis data set, but we also use a policy system without any COVID-related policies. And by comparing the outcomes from these three scenarios, uh, we can derive not only the overall impact of the crisis, but also the independent effects of COVID-related policies and also uh, automatic stabilizers. So uh, finally, some results, which I'll try to run over quickly. So these are the changes in mean incomes in each country, uh, which we attribute to the pandemic. Uh, you can see that in Tanzania, we estimate that the pandemic reduced mean incomes by nearly 10%, while countries like Ghana and Tanzania were much less uh, affected. 
Uh, here, in turn, the total effect is decomposed into different components, basically income changes resulting from COVID-related policies, automatic stabilizers, and then the actual shock to earnings. Uh, and the main takeaway is that COVID-related policies and automatic stabilizers uh, only slightly mitigated the income shocks. Uh, overall, really not that much. Uh, and as I will show later, automatic stabilizers namely alleviated income losses for households at the top of the income distribution, while the policies uh, affected poorer households uh, as well. Uh, here are the effects on poverty and inequality. Uh, the green and red numbers show the share of population uh, earning less than $1.9 per day with and without the COVID shock. Uh, overall, the total effects in black uh, are not huge, uh, they range from a 0.5 increase in Tanzania to uh, a 3.4% increase uh, in Zambia. Uh, here's also some decomposition estimates. Uh, so you can see that uh, poverty actually went up in Ghana because of the policies uh, adopted. And again, this mainly comes from the stoppage of the school feeding program uh, I mentioned. Here you can also see the changes in poverty gaps it's actually increased a little bit more in relative terms than the poverty rates. And uh, basically this tells you that even with few, even if fewer people actually dropped below the poverty line, those that were actually already below the poverty line drifted further below it. Uh, so this is kind of an alternative measure to look at uh, income changes at the very bottom of the income distribution. And finally, uh, here are the effects on the Gini coefficient. Uh, they were relatively small, ranging from no change in Uganda to a 1.7 increase in Mozambique. Uh, then uh, quickly some decomposition results. Uh, this graph shows changes in disposable income in Zambia, decomposed into different uh, sources of these changes. Uh, the white dots uh, show the net effect on disposable income for different income quartiles. And the black bars, for instance, show the earning shock from COVID. And uh, here you can clearly see that higher income households in Zambia lost more earnings and income uh, in, in relative terms uh, compared to poorer households. Uh, also, uh, the emergency gas transfer in Zambia, uh, the policies like this are in the dark gray bars. They actually overcompensated for the income losses uh, among the poorer, uh, poorest households. Uh, yes, sir, you mm. should go towards the conclusion. All right. I'll be quick. Uh, finally, uh, automatic stabilizers had a very limited effect on cushioning income losses uh, in, in Zambia. Basically, only households at the top, in the top quartile uh, benefited from paying less taxes and social insurance contributions because of the reduced earnings. Uh, then just a few more countries. Here, here's the same graph for Ghana. If you look at the black bars, the households in all income quartiles lost some income. But interestingly, again, uh, you can see that the pausing of the school feeding program actually reduced income substantially for the uh, for the poorest uh, households. Yes, I suggest that perhaps we look at the individual uh, countries in the Q&A uh, mm -hmm. time, uh, yeah. if you don't mind. So if you just want to have your like final slide and then I'll give the right. page to Miracle for her discussion. Thanks very much. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, Okay, I, I show really quickly these uh, comparisons between the earning shock across different employment types using the random allocation method and imputation method for Uganda. And this is a pretty interesting finding because when you actually input the uh, losses uh, using the World Bank data, uh, this suggests that informal workers lost quite a bit more uh, income compared to the random allocation method. So this is just a way of showing that there, there are ways to improve our random estimates using uh, micro-level data, which we currently have for Uganda. But yeah, uh, the main findings, uh, we found uh, modest increases in inequality and poverty across the different uh, countries studied. Uh, the effects vary across country, countries. Interestingly, uh, higher income households also experienced rel relatively large uh, income shocks. Uh, one of the reasons for the small GDP for, for the small effects on poverty and inequality was that uh, agriculture was actually not very affected uh, in terms of the GDP shock, and that worked as a buffer against income losses uh, at the bottom of the distribution. Uh, automatic stabilizers had a very limited effect in mitigating income losses. Of course, one reason is high informality. Many people work in the informal sector and are not eligible for any income-interested benefits. 
Uh, and finally, I'll say that uh, the emergency social cash transfer in Zambia was likely quite effective in reducing uh, income losses at the bottom of the income distribution, while in other countries, uh, policies were very limited, uh, with the exception of Ghana. So yeah, I'll stop here and happy to take any questions. Thanks, thanks. thanks very much. Yes, uh, thanks very much. I hope we'll have time to perhaps look into more details into these uh, country results after uh, the discussion. Mir Miracle Ben Hura, uh, the um, the stage is is uh, is is now yours. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. I would like to compliment the presenters for an interesting paper and good work given data limitations in Africa. So the paper is timely and well motivated. But as I was reading it, there's been a lot of um, reference to existing papers in the methodology section, which is a bit uh, kind of uh, a detour for the reader. So I would rec one, like to recommend maybe for an annex to the paper. Then uh, coming back to the generation of the crisis data sets, uh, you mentioned that there's been a random assignment of the labor income shock. But when we are looking at uh, literature, it tells us that some demographic groups were more affected than others. For instance, women and young people could have been more affected than men. And also, as you have highlighted from the Ugandan data, that informal sector was more affected than the formal sector. So I just want to ask that uh, even though you don't have uh, that data for the other countries, is it possible to kind of uh, just try to have an understanding of how the random assignment is capturing informal workers since they form a large segment of the African labor force. Then still on informal workers, when it comes to the simulations, I just want to have an idea of how the simulations were adjusted to cater for the large uh, informality in Africa. So when it comes to results, I've, I'm interested in the result for Ghana, where you are saying that uh, the feeding scheme was a big uh, shocker to the incomes. So my question is, what exactly about the feeding scheme could have uh, propelled uh, this result? Is it about the share of children who are covered? And also, how much more could have households spent on their children? in order to generate such kind of result. Now, another point is related to policies. So you've highlighted that um, the automatic stabilizers and the COVID uh, policies had a negligible effect. So my question is, given Africa's uh, structural configuration of large info informal sector and also fiscal constraints, what um, would your paper will recommend African governments uh, under study to do in order to harness the fiscal systems the size that they'll be in position to minimize the impact of future shocks on the economy? Then I also want to highlight the comparison made in the paper between the results for Africa and results for Europe. So I'm not really convinced that um, those two sets of uh, results are comparable given the different uh, structural configurations of the economies as well as what has been captured in the simulations. So I would like some bit of clarity on that from the authors. So that's uh, what I have at this point. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Miracle. I, I think you, you posed a, a lot of very interesting questions. Most of them are methodological, so I, I think we don't have time, unfortunately, to discuss them here. Perhaps uh, I hope you, you will continue this discussion uh, with Jesse and the co-authors uh, uh, later, but I will give you, uh, I give Jesse the opportunity perhaps to elaborate for one minute on the policy implications of the study. Just one minute, please. That was the hardest question, of course, of all of them. So that's <laughs> really difficult. So yeah, you mentioned very correctly that uh, as as I brought up in the study, uh, automatic stabilizers had a really, really small impact in mitigating any income losses. Uh, of course, one reason for that was the small informal sector in these countries. So 
uh, many people are simply not eligible for income misstested benefits. Uh, and at the same time, there simply are not many, very much, uh, you know, uh, automatic stabilizing policies, for instance, uh, tax revenues, or sorry, <laughs> taxes going down when the crisis hits or automatic social protection measures that would that would be helpful. Um, so as you mentioned, there should be some way of actually getting that revenue to fund uh, automatic stabilizers and overall public spending programs. And that's, of course, really, really hard. Um, so um, I don't think I have any, <laughs> any, any particular solutions other than that should be a priority in the future. Uh, for basically any of the countries in our study and probably for most of Africa as well. So not a very uh, clear quest clear answer, but uh, the question is well, great. If, if a study like that could provide a, a very uh, stronger and clearer policy uh, conclusions, uh, uh, it, it would be fantastic, but perhaps it would be asking a little bit too much. But anyway, thanks very much uh, both to Yese for the presentation and to Miracle for the discussion. I will postpone the Q&A session to the end of, of, of this parallel session if we have time and, and then uh, go straight into the second part of a, of a session which uh, uh, is uh, uh, focused on uh, an application of uh, this tax benefit micro simulation modeling to uh, Latin American countries. And uh, here we have a presentation uh, by Javier and uh, Lourdes. Um, and followed by um, a discussion uh, by uh, Veronica uh, Amarante. Uh, Javier and Lourdes, uh, um, the, Javier is, is a research fellow at the um, University of Essex. Uh, Lourdes is uh, uh, an economist from the Central University of Ecuador. And the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Hey. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, Javier is going to uh, share a presentation. Uh, while um, for me, it's a great honor to present together with Javier uh, the results of two studies carried out uh, in with other uh, authors as well. And we are going to present it uh, about assessing the cautioning effect of tax benefit policies during the COVID-19 pandemic in Latin America. Uh, our motivation is that uh, the evidence of these uh, issues in Latin America remains scarce up to now. And those few studies uh, have focused uh, on the effect expanded on social assistance programs in mitigating the distributional effects. Uh, they, uh, those studies are similar to the findings we uh, found he, uh, in our studies as well. Uh, first, a large increase in poverty and inequality uh, measured by uh, income. And there is a limited effect of expanded social assistance, except for the largest countries like Brazil and Argentina. Uh, our studies are different from those because uh, we not only evaluate the programs, but also we uh, evaluate the task uh, policies and also the social security contributions. Those two components we called uh, automatic stabilizers. So it, uh, we have a more general view about the impact of those uh, policies together. The aim to carry those studies was to assess the role of, of tax benefit policies in mitigating the impact of this, their drop in earnings during the uh, COVID crisis. First, uh, we evaluate it in Ecuador, and then we also expand the analysis to Colombia and Peru. Uh, we evaluate in two, in two main points. The first, uh, the main point of the when the crisis was the hardest was in the second quarter of 2020. And also uh, we uh, evaluated it at the end of the last year, uh, 2020 as well. 
Uh, what we use uh, different from what uh, made uh, about uh, Africa, we use only micro data simulations and we use directly the representative household survey data. Covering uh, the pre-pandemic period, we use like the best line, the uh, fourth quarter of 2019. Then we now cast the earning distribution during the pandemic based uh, again on the official survey collecting data during uh, two periods, the second quarter and the fourth quarter of 2020. So uh, we use micro simulation models to simulate tax benefits policies uh, and household disposable income before and during the crisis uh, for this pandemic uh, crisis in general. So uh, we simulate three income distributions. The first one is uh, about the policy simulated during the pre-COVID data. It means at the end of 2019. Second, we simulate the COVID data based on uh, the best line of 2019 and finally we simulate the policies of COVID data as well uh, during the, the crisis uh, in those two main points. Uh, also, um, uh, well, this, uh, those are the main uh, results about the first study about Ecuador. As we can see in the figure one, the white points are the uh, mean of disposable income. Uh, the overall uh, drop in the income was a uh, 41% on average. But as we can see in this figure, we have a U-shape uh, impact in general. Uh, it comes from two main sources. First of all, the automatic stabilizers have a, a, had a large effect uh, compared with the uh, grant of the family protection, which is the main policy in Ecuador. Uh, we have here in light blue the automatic stabilizers. Uh, we can see that uh, it uh, only affects uh, mainly at uh, the top of the income distribution while the grant or the uh, family protection grant only affects uh, to the poorest uh, families in Ecuador. Uh, so at the end we have a more affected uh, in the middle of the income distributions. Uh, the grant, uh, the policy implemented in Ecuador, contributes to an increase in the mean disposable income of 30%. This is my part uh, about uh, Ecuador. I'm going to let Javier to present the rest of the results for Ecuador and the other countries. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lourdes. I hope you can hear me. I'm going now to share again my screen. Okay. So as Lourdes said, we started this uh, study looking at Ecuador and we noticed the dramatic uh, decrease in household disposable income. Uh, so we wanted to extend the analysis and see what happened in uh, other countries with similar economic characteristics. So we expanded the analysis well in two terms. First, because here we were looking at the second quarter, we were wondering to which extent the economy recovered or not by the end of 2020. So this is uh, the graph that we have here. Figure two compares at the left, the same graph that uh, Lourdes has already discussed. Uh, Q2 in 2020 for Ecuador, whereas the graph at the right presents the result for Q4 2020. So as we see uh, in the last column, the decrease in household disposable income is much lower. So now we have a decrease of around 20% on average, uh, but it remains a decrease. So although the econ economy recovers by the end of 2020, we still see that household disposable income has decreased compared to the pre-pandemic scenario.
Something else that we noticed is that now we do not see the impact of COVID-related policies, so the uh, blue dark bars that we saw for the low income desires. This is because the COVID uh, protection grants that were implemented in Ecuador were implemented only during two months during the second quarter of 2020. Therefore, by the end of the year, although earnings drop and we still see a, a, a drop in household disposable income, there were no policies to mitigate this shock. We see a small effect of automatic stabilizers in the last decile of Q4 for Ecuador. This is because as uh, earnings drops, um, tax and social insurance payments uh, decrease automatically. So we see a lower reduction in disposable income compared to the reduction in earnings. However, it's very limited. So this is what happened um, in Q4 for Ecuador compared to Q2, but now what happened in other countries? Here, figure three presents the results for Peru. Something interesting that we notice uh, for Peru is that the size of the shock is somewhat similar, a bit larger uh, than in Ecuador for Q2. We have a drop in household disposable income. Those are the circles, the, the white circles that you see, of around 40 3, 44% on average. And something interesting uh, as well is that as it was the case in Ecuador, we see also a U-shaped pattern of the decrease of the impact of uh, the COVID pandemic on household disposable income across the income distribution. Contrary to Ecuador, we see that uh, Peru implemented a very generous um, social uh, protection uh, or social protection policies uh, during a Q2 in 2020. So we see that the fall in earnings um, in Q2 was more than compensated for the first uh, income decile group, representing an increase in household disposable income of around 40%. However, now if we turn to Q4 at the right, we see that as it was the case for Ecuador, Q, uh, Peru did not maintain these social, the expanded social protection programs until the end of 2020. Therefore, we still observe a decrease in household disposable income due to the shock in earnings by the end of 2020 in Peru, and there are no policies to mitigate this uh, shock. What about uh, Colombia? This is our next graph. We see that in Colombia, first, if we look at Q2, the decrease in household disposable income was much lower than in Ecuador. In Peru, this is because the decrease in earnings, the, the black bars that you see in the graphs, was much smaller. Uh, we see that um, COVID-related policies in Q2 were more generous than in Ecuador, but not as generous and, uh, 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 as in Peru. However, now if we turn to Q4, we see that there is still a decrease in household disposable income, but out of these three countries, Colombia was the country that decided to maintain the social protection until the end of the year. So we still see an impact of COVID-related policies to mitigate the negative shock in earnings. And we see that this more than compensates the loss in earnings for the first desired group. I'll be very quick now in terms of uh, income inequality and poverty. As we see, I was in the previous graph, there's a huge shock in household disposable income in Q2. So we expect uh, income inequality and income poverty to increase. This is exactly what we see here in figure five for the Gini coefficient. So for uh, the three countries, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, we see a big increase in the Gini coefficient in Q2. Then we see a decrease uh, in uh, Q4 for 2020, but the uh, levels do not return to the pre-pandemic levels. The light blue bar in the, in the bars represent the increase in income inequality that we would have observed if COVID-related policies were not introduced by these countries. So we see that although small, uh, the programs did help mitigate the impact of the crisis in income inequality. And finally, for poverty, we see a very similar picture. Again, a dramatic increase in poverty in uh, Q2 2020 for all three countries. Uh, levels decrease in Q4, but they do not return to the levels of the pre-pandemic. And we see an impact, an important impact of COVID-related policies managing to mitigate uh, the impact of the shock by around three percentage points in Colombia and Peru, much less in Ecuador in Q2. Um, so just to conclude, 
On some map, uh, what we have observed is a dramatic increase in income poverty and inequality between December 2020 and the second quarter of, uh, sorry, December 2019 and the second quarter of 2020 in all three countries. COVID-related benefits have a limited effect, but even more so in Ecuador. Uh, by the end of 2020, the economy recovers. However, household disposable income remains on average lower than the pre-pandemic levels, around 20% lower in Ecuador, Ecuador and Peru, around 12% lower in Colombia. And in terms of policy, uh, we see that Colombia is the only country that maintains COVID emergency policies in place until the end of 2020, and that this helps mitigate the impact of the crisis until the end of the year. And finally, something interesting from this presentation and the other is that if you notice the effect of automatic stabilizers was always concentrated at the top of the income distribution and this is not only because of uh, the design of taxes and social insurance this is also because of the design of benefits which are designed as proxy means benefits because they are proxy means that they are not they are unable to automatically react to income shocks to mitigate the impact of the crisis thank you very much Thank you, thank you, Javier and uh, uh, and Lourdes. Um, in the interest of time, we can go straight to the conclusion. Uh, uh, sorry, to the conclusion to the discussion by uh, Veronica Amarante. Veronica is a professor in the Institute of the Economia from the Economics Department at the University of the Republic in Uruguay. Veronica, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much for for allowing me to to participate in this in this session. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the authors for the article and, and for the presentation. The paper provides a detailed analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on household income and, and it shows uh, the, the effects of the policies. I think it's, it's a very relevant contribution to solve the puzzle about what happened in the region. So there are other other uh, papers uh, who focus on other countries and it's interesting to notice that the results are very similar uh, what what you are what they are finding for the Andean countries is similar to what has been found for other uh, for other uh, countries in the region i have some uh, specific questions or, or suggestions for the paper the first one is if if i understood why some policy responses uh, such as the unemployment insurance or the possibility to withdraw part of the of the private pension funds in peru were not simulated i, I imagine that it, um, probably this is because of of, of data avail availability but I, I i also think that there may be other policies that are not incorporated because of these same problems so uh, in that sense I think it would be interesting to provide the reader the information about how much of the total package of, of policies are being simulated in this exercise, just to give a glance of of, uh, of the of the of the size of the response that you are considering. If it is almost everything, or what kind of things are, uh, could not be included, I assume that it is almost uh, everything. But then I also, uh, apart from suggesting uh, the. Uh, adding the information I would I like to ask about that. Um, I also uh, thought that uh, I also think that uh, this analysis based on no casting it's, it's very interesting but some the, the results you are presenting are presented uh, as deterministic in the sense that we do not have different scenarios or or some uh, or, or we do not see any uh, uh, introduction of some randomness as for example in the first paper that we saw in this same parallel session so that was a something that may help also to check how robust these conclusions that which are based on micro simulations are so that was a second a suggestion the the third one was that a, in each of these countries a certain amount of money is is a, is assigned to 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 the pandemic. So I, depending on the type of policy, that money may help households in the in the in different parts of the distribution. So I think it may be interesting to calculate kind of effectiveness indicators of, of something like that of the policies in terms of the reduction of poverty or the reduction in inequality by dollar or by some uh, Money, monetary measure and to compare uh, the countries and also to see the different the, the 
the different uh, location and effectiveness of, of the of the money. And then I have a, a, a question about the, the the conclusions. I think it's interesting what you are what, what you are saying about uh, the fact that there are uh, no benefit acting as automatic stabilizers because uh, cash transfers are, are designed in other ways, so they they do not act like that. But then, I uh, and, and in the paper you also uh, go ahead and and you said something like that. Um, the the social protection system in the in the region should be uh, we should rethink about the social protections uh, in the in the region thinking about those the the space or the potential space for for automatic stabilizers for this kind of situation so i was wondering if you have some kind of, of policy if you are thinking about some kind of policy intervention in particular uh, just uh, associated to this idea that that uh, cash transfers may not be the the, the more um, the best solution. So, if if it's kind of a, a redesign of, of of cash transfers to be able to cope with this with these situations, or uh, or what kind of policies may may help in these situations. And that's it. And Thanks for joining us for the paper. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, lots of uh, very interesting questions and suggestions. Uh, I will allow Javier Ordurdes to take one and respond for just one minute. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. I'll come uh, to the policy question, as I think, again, is, is uh, relevant for the whole discussion. Um, yes, but perhaps there's two different things to say. The first thing is that uh, social cash transfers in Latin America and in general in African countries, are do reduce poverty and inequality. So if you compare the, the levels of poverty with and without the cash transfers, we do see an effect uh, in reducing poverty and inequality. However, what they, do, they fail to do is to uh, react to economic shocks. So if you see you have an economic shock and people enter to unemployment, they do not they cannot claim, they, can, they are not allowed to claim uh, this type of benefits. Why? Because uh, eligibility is assessed in terms of the characteristics of the uh, dwelling, of the household, of the household heads. And this means that uh, because they do, not, they do not depend directly on household uh, income, people cannot claim a benefit when the household income drops as a result of the job. However, I think it's interesting to think about why it, uh, social protection is designed in this way, and I think it's because they have they have a different role as in developed countries. I think the role of social protection, uh, social assistance programs in the developing countries, is to uh, to fight uh, structural poverty, and that's why they are designed in terms of uh, characteristics, broader characteristics than income. Whereas social assistance programs in developed countries usually also target transitory poverty. Um, so I think, uh, and that's when we discuss about rethinking these programs in, in the paper, I think uh, we are thinking about how to uh, make these two things converge. So should we, should, would it be able to keep uh, certain social uh, assistance programs in developing countries fighting uh, a structural poverty uh, with a design eligibility design that takes into account a large number of dimensions of uh, uh, well-being or say characteristics of households, whereas could we think also about complementing this with social assistance that depends directly in household earnings, so that then when there is an economic shock, people or households would receive an automatic protection rather than depending on the willingness and the revenues of the countries when we face an economic shock. And I think uh, from the, 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 the coverage, the geographic coverage of, of countries that we have uh, seen here, South Africa is one of the countries which stands out from, from other low and middle income countries in the sense that they do have uh, means tested benefits. So I think uh, there is a context and uh, an opportunity to discuss how we could uh, achieve or combine these, these things in the context of Latin America and later on of African countries as well. 
Thanks, Javier. Um, that was uh, perhaps a little bit longer than one minute, but also provided some nice uh, uh, reflections on uh, on uh, um, this uh, general uh, um, type of analysis uh, uh, with respect to other countries as well. Uh, so we had uh, two big papers today and uh, um, lots of uh, very interesting insights and, uh, and comments and feedback from, from the, the discussants. So unfortunately, we don't really have time to uh, take uh, questions uh, from the audience, but I would invite uh, the more than 40 um, participants to the session uh, to contact the authors directly if they have feedback, if they uh, wish to discuss anything. And with that, I really thank all the participants and uh, uh, the authors and presenters and the discussant. And I will now close the session. Thanks a lot to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.